mention the name Jehovah's Witnesses and you get varied responses. Usually a picture springs to mind of two people knocking on your door at inconvenient times, warning you that the end of the world is near. Or perhaps you remember a story in the newspaper or on TV of Jehovah's Witnesses refusing blood transfusions. Who are these people and where do they come from? The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Brooklyn, New York controls the activities and beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses. They have recently published an overview of their history called Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom. In their foreword, they state that, quote, no one knows their modern day history better than they themselves do, unquote. They go on to claim that they will present a candid history. Duane Magnani, director of Witness Incorporated and a recognized expert on the Jehovah's Witnesses, has this comment. We would hope, in view of the statements made by the Watchtower Society in the introduction of this book, that they would present a truthful history of their organization. On page 178, they state that honesty is required in everything they do. They back this up with a scripture from Psalms 31.5, pointing out that Jehovah himself is the God of truth. They have promised honesty in this book, but did they deliver on that promise? David Riccoboni remembers his longtime service at the Society's headquarters printing the Watchtower magazine. He is seen in the 1953 film The New World Society in Action. One, one thing that impressed me as a Jehovah's Witness was our willingness to admit our mistakes. I thought that was great at the time. I knew the society had been wrong in the past when they set dates for the end of the world and some of, I, I saw some of the major changes in their doctrine and I felt you know sometimes I felt upset but I was taught from the time I was a little child that this is the way Jehovah revealed new light through the organization. Jehovah's Witnesses have often been described as a cult. So often in fact that they deny being a cult in their official publication, The Watchtower. In your expert opinion, Mr. Magnani, are they in fact a cult? Yes, Jehovah's Witnesses definitely fit the description of a cult, despite their denials. A cult always has a strong central figure demanding absolute authority. They even admit in the Proclaimers book that a cult developed around Charles Taze Russell, their founder. Charles Taze Russell was born in Allegheny, Pennsylvania in 1852. From age 11, he worked in the family clothing store. He became a successful businessman. At age 17, he came under the influence of the early Second Adventists, who were setting dates for the end. He soon broke ties with the Adventists and launched out on his own, publishing the magazine now known as The Watchtower. His following grew, but trouble was brewing on the home front. In 1906, after a number of marital battles, Russell was divorced from his wife Maria. Instead of sharing his personal assets with her, he transferred them to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which he totally controlled. The Proclaimers book mentions this transfer in a tiny footnote, but we don't read the obvious there. Pastor Russell had cheated his wife. The Proclaimers book makes the repeated point that Pastor Russell was not found guilty of adultery. This was true only because his wife did not bring charges of adultery against him. Instead, she accused him of immorality with a young girl who was residing in their home. It was late in the evening, about 11 o'clock. He put his arms around her and kissed her. This was in the vestibule before they entered the hall, and he called her his little wife. But she said, I am not your wife, and he said, I will call you daughter, and a daughter has nearly all the privileges of a wife. And what other terms were used? Then he said, I am like a jellyfish. I float around here and there. I touch this one and that one. And if she responds, I take her to me. And if not, I float on to others. 
And she wrote that out so that I could remember it for sure when I would speak to him about it. And he confessed that he had said those things. Why would the Proclaimers book say that Maria Russell was seeking prominence for herself when in reality, the court stated, he says himself that she is a woman of perfect moral character and his own testimony is a strong confirmation of her allegations. The judgment described his behavior as cruel and barbarous treatment, adding, his course of conduct toward his wife evidenced such insistent egotism and self-praise that would necessarily render the life of any sensitive Christian woman a burden and make her condition intolerable. I was surprised to find out many strange things about Pastor Russell when I did independent research on him. Here, in the finished mystery book, he taught that the churches of Christendom were started by bald-headed men with smoke on their brains. He thought that if a dog's head were shaped like a man's, the dog could think like a man. He gave health advice that was pure quackery. For example, he taught that appendicitis was caused by biting worms in the colon. He sold so-called miracle wheat at greatly inflated prices to his gullible followers. None of these things are brought out in the Proclaimer's book. They didn't do an honest job of reporting on their founder at all. We are prepared to document that Charles Russell believed he was the sole channel of communication between God and men. He even referred to himself as God's mouthpiece. He's credited with writing the Finnish mystery book, which was completed after his death. It states that Russell was still in charge from heaven. The Bible, produced by the Jehovah's Witnesses, called the New World Translation, has caused quite a stir. Their Proclaimers book claims that it is a literal translation that faithfully presents what is in the original writings, and that the entire translation committee were spirit-anointed Christians. They won't reveal their names. My late husband, Bill Setnar, was at the Watchtower headquarters during the work on the New World Translation. Former President Fred Franz was mainly responsible for the translation work. He was neither a Hebrew nor a Greek scholar and only had two years of college. There were no scholars. I know because I knew them all personally. The so-called translation was written to reflect their own peculiar doctrines. And the Proclaimer's book is not telling the truth when it says that this is a fresh translation from the original Greek. The only original Greek I knew was George Genghis of the Secretive Translation Committee. And he was no scholar, that's for sure. Because he himself told me that before he came to Bethel, he was a short order cook in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Bruce Metzger is recognized as one of the world's leading Bible translators. Dr. Metzger, is the New World Translation reliable for Bible study? The ordinary reader is totally misled by the show of supposed scholarship uh, that these people introduce into their translation. It's a sham kind of scholarship. This could be called not a separate version of the Bible. In this respect, it's a perversion of the Bible. They introduce the word Jehovah 237 times into the text of the New Testament, and it does not occur once in any known Greek manuscript. That, I don't think, is responsible scholarship. Still more key, having to do with the person of our Savior, Jesus Christ. They try every time that they can manage it to denigrate the status of Christ from the eternal Son of God to a created being. They even distort the first verse of 
the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. With a, and the spell there, word God there, the little g. That's terrible. Dr. Metzger, what do you think about the Watchtower Society's former claim that Johannes Grieber's Bible was a translation? Yes, his translation, I years ago got a copy of this because I was interested in his translation from the standpoint of which Greek manuscripts he made use of. Uh, Johannes Graeber, or Grieber, was a former Roman Catholic priest. And uh, after getting married to a woman who was him herself a medium, he got the idea that he could translate the New Testament in a more accurate way if he would have some help from a spirit medium. When the occult background of Grieber was exposed by those outside the society, they stopped referring to him as a scholar. Interestingly, the evidence is that they had known about his occult involvement for nearly 30 years. This kind of deliberate cover-up is found throughout their history, yet it is never referred to in their proclaimers book. Is this candid? Is this honest? Jehovah's Witnesses today believe that Christ's second coming dates from the year 1914, invisibly. The history of this controversial date stretches back to the 1870s. The Proclaimer's Book states that Russell discerned that Christ would return as a glorious spirit person, invisible to human eyes. As early as 1876, he recognized that the year 1914 would mark the end of the Gentile times. They fail to tell their readers that to Russell, the end of the Gentile times was another way of saying the end of the world. In other words, what Russell had really predicted was doomsday for the year 1914. How interesting to know that he has a world affairs in his charge and that the reign of sin and death will soon be overthrown by Messiah's kingdom. Charles Taze Russell engaged in pyramidology to set his dates. He believed that the Great Pyramid of Giza was God's stone witness corroborating biblical time periods. When Russell died in 1916, he was buried near a pyramid which serves as a continuing testimony to his pagan occult teachings. Years later, the organization informed Jehovah's Witnesses that the pyramid was not to be considered as connected to true worship. Thus, we see that the Proclaimer's Book admits Jehovah's Witnesses practiced false worship. The Witnesses claim that Jesus Christ is present and ruling invisibly from the heavens since 1914. What is the significance of this date in light of their prophecies for the end of the world? History has shown the 1914 chronology is false, with clear occultic origins. Therefore, all other dates based on it are likewise false. The Watchtower's founder, Charles Taze Russell, is a false prophet, and therefore, so are his successors, the Watchtower leaders. These charges of occult beginnings are no doubt shocking to modern Jehovah's Witnesses as they deny all connections to the occult. Is there further evidence of occult involvement besides the setting of wrong dates due to pyramidology? After Charles Taze Russell's death, Joseph Rutherford seized control of the society. I'm presently writing a book on Jehovah's Witnesses and the occult. Present-day witnesses may be surprised to learn that their late president, Judge Rutherford, was in contact with spirits. In fact, he claimed to have received instructions from the dead Pastor Russell. He even taught that the organization was not under the direction of the Holy Spirit, but under direction of invisible spirits. None of these facts are brought forth in the Proclaimer's book. Is this candid and honest? Does their organization really have divine guidance as they claim? Or is it based on occultism? The evidence is clear. It is.
The name Jehovah's Witnesses is a distinct one. Previously, they were called Associated Bible Students, or Russellites, as well as a variety of other names. Why the change in 1931? Basically, the name change came about because of Judge Rutherford's jealousy over the influence of the dead Charles Russell. Russell had been well loved and revered by his followers who believed him to be the sole channel of truth, the faithful and discreet slave, even in death. The judge would not stand for this for very long. He wanted a new religion with himself firmly in control. Faithful followers took phonographs door to door so that all could hear the judge calling religion a snare and a racket. It is often said that religion is a snare and a racket, and why? Religion had In this way, the Russellites became the witnesses. Really, they were Joseph's witnesses. The judge forced through a change of name. He claimed that angels had revealed the name Jehovah's Witnesses to him. Now he controlled everything. As the dictator over Jehovah's Witnesses, he remained firmly in charge until his death in 1942. Jehovah's Witnesses have a long history of false dates for the end of the world, stretching back over a hundred years. Most all modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses are not aware of the facts. I was a fourth-generation Jehovah's Witness and met Judge Rutherford personally as a child. From the writings of Charles Russell, my great-grandparents and other early believers learned and believed the end would be here by 1914. We had a large library of Watchtower books in our home. My family believed each world war would end in Armageddon as they had been taught. This proclaimer's book is just not truthful. The real facts are covered over. My mother's family were international Bible students, the early version of Jehovah's Witnesses. The date 1925 was taught for the beginning of paradise on earth. The Watchtower said, Millions now living will never die. Farmers were told they didn't have to plant their crops that year. Because my grandfather planted his crops early in 1925, the family were looked down upon for their unfaithfulness. There were no apologies from the Watchtower Society when the 1925 date failed. When paradise didn't arrive, um, as they always did, the society had to uh, keep the myth going. So they built this palatial mansion in California called Beth Serim. It was to be, it was to house the princes, and they call it the House of Princes. It was for uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, it was supposed to be there for them when they returned from the dead, which the witnesses were expecting to happen at any time. But it was, and it was actually deeded to the princes but it was Judge Rutherford who moved in and enjoyed it. As a zealous Jehovah's Witness, I was given information about Beth Sarim in the 1960s, including the fact that the society had taught that the Old Testament prophets would show up and identify themselves to the Watchtower leaders. One unshaven tramp even showed up and tried to claim Beth Sarim, but he was sent on his way by the society. My father was a friend of uh, Judge Rutherford, and as a young child, I remember people talking about uh, the uh, judge's uh, drinking problem, and it never seemed to bother anybody. And uh, when I got to Bethel, um, I heard those stories confirmed by older Bethelites who used to talk about how they smuggled whiskey in from the Canadian branch for him. The Watchtower Society denies teaching the end of the world for the period we call World War II. I remember the time period of World War II as a Jehovah's Witness. We had been led to expect that there would be no winning side in World War II, but only Armageddon. I served as a full-time pioneer until I was arrested and sent to prison for five years. I refused military service in obedience to the watchtower. My wife and I tried our best to live according to the instructions from the society. We gave up having children since Armageddon was so close. Now, 
I have no children to, to help me in my remaining years. I wish I'd never believed the children book. Judge Rutherford died and a new president, Nathan Knorr, took over. I remember Nathan Knorr very well. I was at Bethel headquarters for four years while he was president. Charles Taze Russell was responsible for the failed prophecies of 1874 and 1914. Judge Rutherford was responsible for the 1925 failure as well as the World War II failure. Nathan Knorr, under the influence of Vice President Fred Franz, was responsible for the 1975 false prophecy. I remember how excited we all were as we studied this book, Life Everlasting in the Freedom of the Sons of God, and learned that 1975 would mark the end of the 6,000 years of man's history from the date of Adam's creation. That meant that Armageddon would come in 1975, and then the final 1,000 years of Christ's millennial reign would start. We all stepped up our field service time. Don Nelson was a Gilead graduate in 1956. He was trained for world missionary service. He is pictured in the Proclaimer's book on page 525. I remember with some uh, nostalgia the happy days in the Kingdom Hall locally where my wife and I attended. The way the watchtower representatives, the circuit overseers, would come by and say, edging forward and whispering confidently into the microphone, only 37 months till Armageddon, brothers. And then on the succeeding trips, only 24 months till Armageddon, brothers. And only 12 months till Armageddon, brothers. Unfortunately, my wife and I left Watchtower Society in 1974, which was the year before Armageddon was supposed to hit and demolish the world. So we never did find out how the circuit overseers dealt with only one month till Armageddon, brothers, or only one month after Armageddon, brothers, because we had by this time found out the lie of the Watchtower chronology, and we saw it for what it really was, inane, insane. 1974 was a very difficult time for me. I, I was freaking out. Uh, I had to make a decision, a critical decision, because my wife uh, had to undergo surgery and the doctor said she needed a blood transfusion. And I had to make the decision. And the brothers were encouraging me to make the right decision to please Jehovah, because after all, uh, Armageddon was only a year away and even if she died, she'd be resurrected right away. You could just imagine the fear. I had so much fear. It was so frightening. I was near death. I was in the hospital. And the brothers and sisters told me to take my stand for Jehovah and don't accept a blood transfusion. Uh, if I accepted the blood transfusion, I would die at Armageddon. If I didn't and I died, I'd be resurrected. The Great Tribulation was coming. It, it was 1974, and 1975 was at our doorstep and uh, by staying loyal to Jehovah, I would be resurrected. So that was the hope I was given. A few years before 1975, the elders convinced me to sell my stamp collection, which had been in my family for three generations. Had I kept it, it would be worth over a million dollars today. When the date 1975 failed, I realized that they were wrong, and I soon left the organization. I remember how we were kept on the edge of our seats at our assemblies in the late 1960s while a society paraded one couple after another onto the platform who had sold their houses and goods and had gone full-time in the ministry for the few remaining months before Armageddon. Some remortgaged their homes. Some emptied their bank accounts. My family and I sold our home and moved to where the need was greater so all could hear the message of the Watchtower prior to 1975. Well, in 1973, I started a company called Trimline, which eventually employed about 1,500 Jehovah's Witnesses through uh, literally hundreds of distributors. Uh, there were many that came to me, they wanted to go into business so they could pioneer. Uh, after all, 1975 was approaching. And then as 75 got closer, though some criticized me, even calling me the ridiculer of Second Peter. And uh, I just told them, 
Well, when the watchtower stops growing, I'll stop growing. And of course, here we are today, many years later. I remember the hush that fell over us Jehovah's Witnesses at the assembly when the announcement was made to hold Bible studies no longer than six months. In view of 1975 coming up fast, one brother conducted 16 Bible studies, but at the end of six months, he had none. The circuit overseer told us not to be upset when our Bible studies fizzled out. He said, those people had had their chance and did not deserve to live in Jehovah's new order if they couldn't make up their minds to be Jehovah's Witnesses in six months. We were told to go out and look for others and hurry. 1975 came and went without Armageddon and without the ushering in of the thousand year reign of Christ. All were to be destroyed other than Jehovah's Witnesses. How did the Watchtower Society handle this embarrassment? As usual, the Society blamed its members for the failed prophecy, just as they had done in the past. President Nathan Knorr took a back seat as Vice President Fred Franz tried to cover up the failure. He started with denial. Franz admitted disappointment on the one hand, but on the other hand, he refused to admit his guilt in setting the date. He said he hadn't been specific, but he had. He said he didn't definitely say Armageddon would come by 1975. He only said it might, but anyone attending the assemblies knew otherwise. Much more was said than was printed. So you see, 1975 was a major disappointment to all. When Nathan Knorr died in 1977, Fred Franz went on to become president of the society. Did he continue to deny responsibility for the 1975 failure? Fred Franz continued to deny his responsibility for 1975. I had the opportunity to personally confront Franz in a telephone interview and pointed out to him that his denials held little weight. After all, he had been very specific about 1975 in the publications, and I read him a few quotes. I told him that's why Jehovah's Witnesses gave up everything for 1975. It was Franz who forced them to believe 1975 would see the end. He was now at a loss for words. His own statements had condemned him. He was a false prophet, and I told him so. We have certainly seen many pertinent historical facts misrepresented or missed entirely in the Proclaimer's book. Yet within its pages, we do find many potentially self-condemning admissions if we look for them. On page 641, we still find the claim, in spite of continually changing doctrine and failed prophecies, that Jehovah's Witnesses are advancing in the light of truth. We need to ask, what is this latest light? Even after their last prophetic blunder, they just can't resist hinting around about dates for the end of the world. They are still clinging to 1914 as the starting point for the last generation, and several references in their publications now seem to point to the year 2000. This would make the last generation a long one indeed. From 1914 to 2000 is a total of 86 years. Time is the enemy of a false prophet, and they will soon need new light on 1914. I have been watching the history of the Watchtower Society all of my life, both inside and outside the organization, and I feel Isaiah 820 applies to them. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Proclaimer's book makes much of the human leadership over Jehovah's Witnesses and how this mantle of authority was passed on after the death of each president. But they have made certain false statements concerning how Jehovah's Witnesses looked at these leaders. The Watchtower has blamed the People's Pulpit Association for establishing sectarianism around their founder, Charles Russell. 
Modern Jehovah's Witnesses may be surprised to learn that the People's Pulpit Association is the early name of the Watchtower Society in Brooklyn, New York. It was they themselves who published the claim that Charles Russell was the creature God had chosen above all others. Early followers of Russell were giving him the status and honor that amounted to creature worship. Modern day Jehovah's Witnesses should check this out for themselves and not just swallow blindly the statements in the Watchtower literature. With so much deliberate deception going on, there is usually big money behind the work of the cults. Is this true of the Watchtower Society? One has only to look at the property purchased by the Watchtower Society in Brooklyn, New York and outlying regions. This is some of the highest priced real estate in the world and they have the cash to purchase it. Those of us who worked long hours at headquarters did so for a pittance. We believed we were serving God. We were willing slaves for the Watchtower organization and helped to make it a wealthy publishing company. Money poured in from the congregations and workers in the field. Prior to the introduction of the goods and services tax in Canada, Jehovah's Witnesses paid for their literature at the local Kingdom Hall and sold it at the doors, keeping the money for themselves. This huge volume of literature sales would have cost the society millions of dollars in taxes. Instead, Jehovah's Witnesses received new light just as the tax became law. Oh, they still pay for their literature at the Kingdom Halls, but it's called a contribution. They now shamelessly solicit funds at the doors when they place their literature, but they no longer get to keep that money they must hand it over to the society as well. How clever of the Watchtower Society. Now they get paid twice for all their literature and are getting richer than ever. The Watchtower Society has also gone to the contribution method in the United States and other countries to rake in more tax-free money. They even went so far as to file a document in court in support of Jimmy Swaggart a now defrocked and scandal-ridden minister who gave gifts in exchange for contributions, all tax-free. Interestingly, while they believe he is of the devil, they jumped to his support when it suited them, all to get out of paying taxes. The present contribution method is a real windfall for the society. Oftentimes, the organization is not content with just soliciting donations. I have been involved in several court cases where the society has shown how unscrupulous they really are. Money is solicited from the elderly, the sick, the highly mentally suggestible, who believe that giving their money to the Watchtower Society will help them obtain everlasting life. This, in my opinion, is a horrible abuse in the name of religion. I had no reason to doubt my loving parents who raised me in the organization. Although I was an honor student, I gave up college and went to Watchtower headquarters. There I met Bill, and we shared many questions and concerns about the organization during our courtship. We questioned especially the blood issue. We ended up leaving Bethel to get married and moved to my parents' farm. We were very happy until someone reported our doubts about blood transfusion. We were both finally disfellowshipped and disowned by our families. With our inheritance lost and no job training, we started our lives over. We researched the organization and proved they were false prophets and wrong on doctrine too. We saw that we had put the organization where Christ should have been. We determined to serve Christ, not some organization, and have done so with great joy ever since. Bill is home with the Lord now, and I'm carrying on our ministry with the Lord's help. Although my family still shuns me, I pray 
that they may one day turn from the organization to faith in Jesus Christ. I was converted to Jehovah's Witnesses when I was 18 years old and seeking for God. I gave up earning an honors degree in university to devote myself to the organization. I'm ashamed now at the control I gave to the organization over my life. I nearly died refusing a blood transfusion. I let the elders make decisions I should have made. At an assembly in 1972, I stayed with my Christian uncle, who immediately set his church to praying for my deliverance from the Jehovah's Witnesses. As they prayed and a Christian shared his faith, I finally questioned doctrine, especially about Jesus supposedly being Michael the Archangel. I took my concerns to the elders. I found out you cannot ask honest-hearted questions, nor is there any honorable way out of the organization. I left early in 1975, causing an uproar in the congregation, since Armageddon was expected in a few months. It was the best decision I ever made, other than receiving Christ as my Savior. And my husband Keith and I have served the Lord ever since. I began studying with Jehovah's Witnesses in the early 40s. Then after I came out of prison, I continued as a Jehovah's Witness until 1970. However, I had been reading forbidden Christian books. And also, I was not living the life that I should have been. And I confessed to the elders and they dispensed with my 26 years of service in 10 minutes. I was out. But then a loving Christian friend put his arms around me and showed me the love of Christ. And I, I felt more love from him in 10 minutes than I felt from the organization in 26 years. And later, while reading a Christian book, I knew for certain that Jesus Christ is God, and I fell to my knees and received Him as my Savior. Well, when I was six months old, my parents became Jehovah's Witnesses, and I lived totally for the organization for 50 years. But I saw so many injustices over the years, and so much unkindness, so little mercy. You know, they present a facade of love, but people are really sacrificed for the sake of the organization. And finally, after they destroyed my family, I began to research the Watchtower organization and to read the Bible. Because I wanted to know if the Watchtower was God's channel, and I wanted to know how to get eternal life. Well, I found out that Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life, not some organization. And of course, Jesus gives us eternal life. I was in my third year of college in 1973 and thinking about law school. At that time, my Jehovah's Witness parents told me that Armageddon was due by 1975. I had 18 months to live. So I quit school and went back to Jehovah's Witnesses. But as God would have it, some wonderful Christians showed me that I was following a false prophet. The facts were right in my own books. Now, I don't like being lied to. When I found out the watchtower had deceived me, I knew I was in a cult. But then something wonderful happened. I accepted Jesus as my Lord, and He would never lie to me. So many people have accepted the lie by reading the Watchtower. Now I have dedicated my life to showing them the rest of the story, the real story about Jehovah's Witnesses, a non-profit organization. My prayer is that Jesus will open the eyes of many Jehovah's Witnesses to see the love of Christ. This program has examined the book, Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom. The Watchtower leaders herald it as the true history of their religion. But as you have now seen, their account of their history is a perversion of the facts. Yet they declare that all must believe them to be saved. In fact, the Watchtower arrogantly invites us to come to Jehovah's organization for salvation. 
But Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Whose invitation will you accept? My friend, the next time there's a knock at your door, you may greet one bringing the message of the watchtower. But just remember that as a Christian, you are the true proclaimer of God's kingdom. And he is a person who needs Christ because he is a member of a cult, the cult of the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, a non-profit organization. For further information documenting the facts in this presentation, please contact Witness Incorporated, Box 597, Clayton, California, 94517. In Canada, contact McGregor Ministries, Box 294, Nelson, British Columbia, V1L 5P9.